Tadashiva Samaramba, Shankara Sharya Madhyamam, Asmada Sharya Payanta, Bande Guru Param Param, Ishvara Gurat Meti, Muti Veda Vibhagine, Yom Abda Vyatta Dehaya, Dakshina Bhuta Yenamaha, Sava Vedanta Sedanta, Gocharam Tama Gocharam, Govindam Paramanantam, Tats Guru Pranatosh Maham, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti Om. Namaste. And uh, I haven't got any questions or any emails with questions. So, shall we meditate, go into silence and Hi Mark. Last last week you or last class you you mentioned something about your your nididhyasana that maybe could uh, could help us to get started here. Or oh, you wrote some um, we wrote some straight after our last class, which was yeah. yeah, I I did Arlindo. I was just looking to see if I could find it now. What I wrote basically. I wrote, I said, I understand the Satya Mitya teachings, Satya being the only reality, the only independent reality, and Mitya being the apparent dependent reality of names and forms, etc., which appears superimposed on Satya. Trying to grasp the reality of this, my mind asked, why can't objects exist in our consciousness or in consciousness? My mind came up with the example of objects existing in space without modifying space. Um, and even if they only enjoy a temporary, forever changing existence, um, that would make um, uh, consciousness, sorry, consciousness could still be independent and jivas could still claim to be that consciousness, that being our very essence. That would make consciousness a matter um, both exist. And I then go on to say, um, Vedanta could still work as a duality. Um, hold on. And in some way, this would make it easier to understand by removing the Mithya teachings. So basically, it was an inquiry into um, non duality, really. And if it's possible for duality to actually exist or for matter to actually exist in consciousness. Yeah. So you, you, are, you are raising the question yeah, about uh, the, the nature of reality as non-duality. So, and you, you, are, you are analyzing, yeah? you are contemplating the notion that, uh, that that uh, object could also be real. They appear in consciousness, but they enjoy uh, of the same yeah. of, of reality, a sat, existence, né? that which it always is. So the, 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 simple, yeah. the simple logic that uh, debunk that, that notion is that uh, the objects that appear in consciousness, as we know, as we experience it, you know, they they are bound by time, because everything that appears, they appears in time, and then they disappear in time. Okay, so they are byproduct of Maya, space time. Okay, so therefore, all objects they cannot enjoy the same status as 
satya, that which exists ever present without ever changing, because everything comes, grows, gets older, and then go. Né? Everything comes, grows, in the case of the jiva, né? it, it grows and then experience old age, disease, and then the, the deconstruction of né? this assemblage of, of this, these elements that constitute the, the jiva, né? the body-mind complex. So everything has this temporal apparent existence. Why it's apparent? Because it's something that was not there before and it's not afterwards and it's only in between cannot be real, you understand? It's apparently real, which is the way we define mitya. Mitya, the objects of mitya, which includes our body-mind, huh? they, they enjoy of this, of this apparent existence that is borrowed from existence, you know, from existence itself. And it exists, you know, as a temporary phenomenon that can be observed, can be illumined, revealed, observed, and known in consciousness by consciousness. Consciousness is that which is always ever present. And as we know, we don't modify as consciousness. So now the body-mind, which is your inquiry release, is also to bring the object body-mind within consciousness. Why am I not real as a body-mind? So when we say that the Jiva Atma is Paramatma, we, uh, we do that by negating reality to Jiva Atma. You understand? We cannot say Jiva Atma is Satya, and yet, you know, yes. may as uh, uh, firmly, firmly identify with the Jiva Atma. You understand? When we say Jiva Atma is Paramatma, Paramatma, and it's a negation of the reality of the Jiva Atma, Okay, the jiva is only satya to the degree that he understands that the jiva is not a jiva, it is consciousness, it is satya, it is brahman, it is the consciousness, because the jiva, this phenomenal jiva, it, it, it is consciousness, but how we, how we know that we are consciousness? By the means of this reflection, né? the chidabasa, chidabasa, this reflected consciousness, which is by nature consciousness itself. So this consciousness that shines in the intellect of all jivas allows the jiva to understand that this notion, I, the jiva, the complex body-mind, oh my God, I'm not really the body-mind complex, I am consciousness. So this knowledge, it can only be apprehended in the intellect of the human jiva. And it should destroy the understanding, the notion of, of, of this ignorance that the jiva is real. It's only by the rejection of reality as the jiva. The jiva is just the wave in the, in the ocean, you understand? Just imagine, you want to say that the wave now got enlightened and the wave understood that I am the ocean, I am the water of the ocean, but yet, you know, I want to hold on to my name and shape as, as this beautiful wave. You understand? No, the only way is to dissolve, right? intellectually dissolve that notion that I am a wave. In this new notion, I am consciousness. You understand? This notion, I am the ocean, is true to the fact of the fundamental, essential, free nature of the wave as the ocean. It is a notion, but now it's a notion that is truthful to reality, to what it is, because the wave fundamentally is not a wave, it is the water of the ocean. So when we get this knowledge right, when we have this, this notion right, which is the notions present to us by the scripture, you know, and then that notion is no longer a human notion that, that that notion is sat, is consciousness, it's existence. You understand? It's sat chitananda, it's the truth. The truth is that which cannot be challenged, cannot be denied. And how we cannot deny? And why we cannot deny? Because nobody can never really deny 
one's existence as conscious awareness. We can deny our existence as all these modifications that occur in the body-mind, which are subject to temp time, which is going to have an end. All of these we can deny. But when we go through this Vedantic process of rejecting and denying not this, not this, not this, we come to a point of that which can never be denied. So what is that which can never be denied? Is the light of conscious awareness which illumines, reveals, and know any and everything that can be negated as real and understood as apparently real media. You understand? So <clears throat> the jiva needs to negate its body mind construct and, and uh, claim its true existence, its true nature, its true identity as consciousness, that in which the body mind complex is revealed, known, you know, experienced, and so on. And it's bound by time, the body mind con construct. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I understand, you know, that the only permanent reality is consciousness and everything else is changing. I totally grasp yeah. that. Um, yeah. And, I was and, just wondering, um, yeah. but, you know, the body mind is changing, but the energy is always there. It's just changing. You know, when the body dies, it turns to back to ashes or to earth. Yeah. The energy is never not there. So it doesn't, yeah disappear from existence yeah um and that that's what that i was going that to that that is that that is the teaching that is the teaching about ishwara jiva and jagata they are eternal principles they are beginningless eternal principles. and when you say if the jiva exists without beginning and uh, it is going to continue existing as the eternal jiva and then it must be real because it's eternal you understand it exists sometimes as potential and sometimes manifests as physical matter, the body-mind complex, which depends on the, the gross body. And then we'll say, okay, then it's real because it exists forever. And then we have to understand that it's not really real because it's in constant flux of modification, okay? And it is yeah. known and experienced yeah. as something that is a superimposition of consciousness. It's an apparent reality. Energy and matter is an appearance in consciousness. The whole universe is nothing but energy, okay? So sometimes this energy grows fast to become the physical material universe that we experience and know. But all of this energy, which exists all the time, sometimes in the sleeping night of Brahman, and sometimes in the, in the awakening of Brahman, the universe comes again. It exists again and again, always, either as a, a seed form potential or as the manifest physical material universe. So then we say everything exists forever without beginning and without an end, and then it must be real. No, it exists beginning as a, a superimposition in awareness, you understand? As a projection in awareness, as a configuration of these elements yeah. which are brought forth from Maya, you understand? Which does not have an independent existence because everything depends on this consciousness of ours, that in which all of this comes and is, is known. Yeah. So the only, the only principle that is always present and furthermore, never modifying to any, any object, any experience, okay? In the presence of the universe, in the absence of the universe, this consciousness, which is our nature, awareness, is always present, okay? So now the universe, Although it exists beginninglessly and endlessly, it's not real. It exists beginningless and endlessly as a superimposition in that which is the only reality, 
the light in which all of these names and forms are superimposed. The, the snake, the, the, the rope in, on which all the snakes get superimposed. You understand? So the rope is always there. The snake sometimes is superimposed. Yeah. And then it's no longer superimposed. And then somebody else passes by. And then again, superimpose the snake on the rope. And then the, the, the misunderstanding is resolved. So the rope is always there. The snake, you know, exists beginning and lastly as a misunderstanding, as a projection, as a misconception, exists potentially. Sometimes manifest, sometimes not manifest. Misapprehension, proper apprehension. Of the rope as a rope, the rope as a snake. Okay? So the rope, the, the rope is always ever there without change. The superimposition keeps change. It exists as a potential. It exists sometimes manifest by the traveler. Okay? But it's not real. You understand? It exists. We have to be careful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank Although you. I it, understand. it exists. Yeah. I'll just close. Although it, it does exist. Even my just came up. Hold on, we got a bit of a time lapse here. My mind just came up with this little inquiry. It, it was interesting in one way to see how the mind can make everything super complicated. Um, you know, taking this, this teaching and trying to, uh, trying to pick holes in the teaching. Um, but that, that's, that's the way, that's what we twisted we, around. But yeah, no, absolutely. We, we, need, we need to expose these doubts, this, this. Sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't hear your last. No, I said that's the process. We need to, we need to uproot these doubts, this, this suspiciousness we have in, in, in respect to these statements of the Upanishads, all these questions, you know, all this, because those are, are the, the things that somehow prevents us to fully appreciate the benefits of this, of this knowledge, you know, of this scriptural knowledge. So we need to do what you're doing. You need to expose these doubt, doubts so that your knowledge becomes more and more uh, 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 doubtless self-knowledge, you understand? Because you don't want to be in a position that you are not sure. Oh, I'm not sure yeah. if I am Mark or if I am my dog. You know, just imagine if you would be oscillating between the notion that I am Mark, no, I am my dog. So then you will go to a doctor to resolve that question, that doubt, until you are clear that you are Mark. So likewise, you need to, to clear those doubts. You know, oh no, I'm the Jiva and I'm real. But the scriptures say that I'm not Jiva. I'm, I'm consciousness and I'm, I'm, I'm the only reality and I'm not bound by time and so on. So these doubts need to be resolved as, as you are doing now. Very good. Somehow I'm struck by, we yeah. use the word dissolve when you use the word dissolve um it's it's not a task it's not something that we have to do it's something that we have to allow to happen so to allow you know to to to, to dissolve to to melt to be well uh, back into con you know into consciousness so it's like um but we don't have to do it if we if we're doing it um uh that's not acknowledging the fact that we we are it already so um it's somehow it's like again it's like using language but i'm thinking i need to allow myself or allow the jiva to dissolve into consciousness and it's not something i have to do does that make sense well i mean it, there are doings and doings and doings so we can do a lot of things physically verbally mentally and we can do certain things on the very, very in subtle intellectual level. So we need to do this inquiry, this discrimination, you know, which is a very subtle sort of activity, you understand? So what is, what is the result of contemplation, reflection, discrimination? It's, it's pure knowledge. That's our goal, you understand? So there is a certain doing there. 
but it's a doing that it's a doing that produce knowledge, understanding, as opposed to doings that are going to produce a, 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 a an experience as a result. You understand? So it there is a certain doing that we do, Dave. Okay, but it's a very subtle intellectual level, inquiry level uh, doing. That is, that's what we call yana and yana pala. Yana pala is the result of this, of this inquiry, this self inquiry, following the logic as presented by the scriptures with the help of a friend. So, this is what we do as yanis, as, as Vedantins, right? So, there is a certain doing. We cannot just say, no, I, I will. I will just uh, allow my 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 <clears throat> my miss or my ignorance to dissolve uh, or to be resolved or to be removed or neutralized. I'm going to allow it, and and I'm not going to do anything. I'm not even going to contemplate, meditate, or study the scriptures. No, you need to do a certain doing in order to to remove the ignorance. But it is an intellectual doing, which is called self-inquiring or discrimination of Viveka, right? Which is different from saying, no, I don't do, I just, I just need to allow it to happen. Those are vague notions that we need to be careful with, vague abstract notions. I, I guess the, the, I, I, I understand and we have to, rem you know, it's a task. I mean, we talk about, you know, karma yoga, we talk about yana yoga. These are the things that we can do and uh, to remove ignorance. Um, and ultimately, it, when ignorance is removed, then we're, 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 we're resided knowledge and, uh, um, and you know, we call it self-realization. But I, I mean, it's, it's a matter of, it, when, when all things are removed, then there's nothing else to do. When ignorance is removed, there's nothing left to do. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. When when the ignorance is removed, so we don't need to do our, our inquiry anymore as a means to 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 neutralize our ignorance. So if our, our if our ignorance about who we are, I'm, I'm searching for myself. I'm searching. Once I find that I am the self, I'm searching for. I stopped searching for it because I know I am the tense man. So the ignorance was resolved. So, and then we have a doubtless knowledge that does not require further inquiry, further investigation, because now I know, you understand? So we don't need to do anything on those terms anymore. Yet it is, it is recommended that we keep association with the scriptures, why? Because Maya and, and Avidya, it's uh, it's very cynic. Sometimes you know, if we if we loosen up too much, you know, sometimes ignorance may may deceive us a bit here and there, you know. So even if we remove all of ignorance, myths just still exist. So we're, we're, there's no way you know, we're totally, you know, we removed all ignorance and, and mythia exists. So we have to, uh, um, so I mean, we, we, don't, we don't stop doing in terms of trying to remove the ignorance because the ignorance leaves, but it's temporary. It's that you can't, you can't be permanently, uh, you can't permanently reside in knowledge. If, as long as you're alive, as long as you're a jiva, as long as, you know, this body mind construct exists, then you really, you know, it's, it's, it's you, know, you can't live, you can't live, you can't stay permanently um, in knowledge. Well, it, it's, You're yes, always fighting too. yes, and no. Uh, the, the direct self knowledge, it's uh, it, when it, when it, when it comes, it's clear. And, uh, and that is something that cannot be reversed, you understand? So you know now who you are. But as, as you probably heard me explaining a few times, when we know who and what we are, which is what everything is, it does not necessarily uh, cancel all those bits and pieces of vasanas 
you know, based on, on ignorance, which is still sitting or deposit in the causal body. You understand? So that's why we need to, it's, it's recommend to keep association with this scriptural knowledge. Because one thing is to self-recognition. Oh, yes, I got it. I know who I am. Another thing is, okay, now am I going to live my life from, from this knowledge? And is this knowledge clear? Has this knowledge the power to fully cancel the ego, the sense of uh, the sense of self important importance? Because now I am enlightened. I am a guru. Or whatever you know, is this knowledge you know going to really cancel the sense of uh, authorship, ownership, you know, and the doership? So this is all process of what Ramji calls self actualization. You know, which is what we call moksha, which is gradually convert this self knowledge into a hard and fast self knowledge in which the sense of uh, of the ego, this ego sense, is is dissolved. You know, so that's that's what we mean by by that's what I mean when I say that uh, this process is almost like an endless process, which which is a process of a spiritual elevation. Which is different, uh, uh, different from self recognition. Self recognition is something that happens, and you know who you are. But that does not make you a, a person completely free from ignorance. Why? Because everybody is constituted by by the three energies, and in the, in the, in the mind, the mind of all of us, the intellect of the jiva, it depends on the subtle body. And here and there, there will be the influence of more Rajas and more Tamas that could make this self-knowledge, you, you understand, to go into eclipse for a little bit, you understand? And then when it goes into eclipse, it's better you, you remember, you know, the teachings and uh, or even better for prevention, it's better you keep an association with these teachings as a hobby. So for, for security, Reasons, let's say, you know what I mean? <clears throat> Does it make sense, David? The Yanya is the one who knows, but that does not make him uh, someone who is totally free from any residual ignorance, you know, or, or ignorant vasanas that from time to time surface. So, to the extent that this natural process, I often present this, the process of the of father purification or refinement of the intellect of the yani after self-recognition is a very, very natural and effortless process, provided the yani remains associated to, to the scriptures and possibly to, to his or her guru, you understand? Why? Because ignorance is, is, is very sneak and, and hardwired wired as we know and it, it sometimes it, it, it comes in a moment of, uh, of uh, excess of rajas or tamas you know one may you know make the, the sense of doership or any one of these sense you know may surface which is ignorance manifesting itself you know rajas and tamas so it's more on those terms you know you understand, David? Is it clear when I say yes and no? It's well, yes and no. <laughs> yes, and is it clear? Yes and no. I just it just seems like you know moksha is um, um, is moksha permanent or is it uh, is it temporary? So is moksha just well, uh, more of mythia? And, the, the, uh, I, I don't I don't really like much this notion this term moksha. Because when we look at the, in, into this word and uh, and we we take it literally for what it is, which is total freedom. First, we need to look and see freedom from what. So fundamentally, it's fr freedom from the ignorance, yeah? ignorance in respect to the nature of the I, nature of the self. So the moksha is total freedom from this ignorance, total freedom from from conflict from negative emotions or strong reactions. Moksha is, is total freedom from suffering and so on. So 
to a large extent, the yen does not does not suffer, you know. But it does not mean that he may not have some some overreactions here and there or some negative thoughts that cross his mind and, and then all of that. So when we talk about moksha, we have to be careful because there is no such a thing as absolute moksha for most of us, you understand? And moksha, what moksha does? Moksha would end the cycle of reincarnation to the soul. Why? Because ignorance is what makes us somehow here and there uh, experience these this reactions, emotional, you know, ego-centered reactions based on ignorance. So this fundamental ignorance sometimes manifests themselves as our behavior here and there. But the yen immediately, it somehow, it recomposes itself because the knowledge is clear and alive in his mind, you understand? So what is absolutely moksha? Absolutely moksha is there is no ignorance left Left, my life is the best possible example of dharma. It's like someone is pure, pure compassion, and the and the and the individual, the creature that comes close to this description of moksha in my mind is Sri uh, Sri Ramana, uh, Bhagwan Ramana uh, Maharaj. So that is an example of uh, of an individual that has 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 come to a very, very extensive uh, uh, level of, of purity, you know, of sainthood and firming that knowledge. And uh, so the scriptures say that when one gets moksha, this absolutely moksha, and then definitely one has no desires and, and aversions left to produce another reincarnation. Then moksha is is the end of the individual soul, you understand? But uh, we never know, because every human being is a byproduct of these three energies. We need to develop enough sattva to, to, to get this knowledge clear and, and firm in the way that we know for sure it's a doubtless self-knowledge in the moment of sattva, a mind which is already uh, uh, very, very extensively conditioned by more sattva, more clarity, more focus, more flexibility, more openness. So that that intellect is has has a better chance to gain this knowledge and retain this knowledge. But that does not necessarily okay destroy all residuals of ignorance. So I'm a uh, uh, Bhagwan. Ramana Maharaj used to say sometime, talk a little bit about the remainings of ignorance, which which is still lying around in the subtle, in the causal body. You understand? So, what is moksha then? Moksha is freedom from rajas and tamas. It's free job is, is having a mind so firm in self knowledge and so sattvic, you know, that basically it does not experience any any more conflict or, or misapprehensions and, uh, and but this is the, the the human nature is 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 always subject to some rajas and tamas you understand i heard that from different gurus including isagadat maharaj you know so these uh, these aspects of the personality may show up here and there but the yani they it, it's just it recomposes itself because the knowledge is serves as a is a bumper, like an airbag, you know, immediately it, it brings the yani back to its, its self-knowledge, you understand? But there is room for certain reactions which are not the best example of moksha, so to say, you understand? So we want, I mean, we want the self-knowledge because we want to live a life which is as free as possible of, of uh, emotional, mental suffering, you understand? So we don't want to experience suffering. And that is only possible when once this knowledge is so, so profoundly retained, clearly and firmly retained at all times, you understand, to, to, to somehow to neutralize the 
adversities that life throw at us at all times. You understand? So this knowledge needs to be really, really deeply and firmly, clearly internalized and, and retained at all times. So to what degree we can say, oh, that person got moksha, that person got moksha. Every time I hear this, this description of this got moksha, now I got moksha, I laugh inside with myself, you know, because this is all relative, you know. I'm not saying that there is no such a thing as sainthood, somebody who is so pure and all thoughts and intents, they are pure, they are for the good of all beings, you know? And a life which is a life of, of a yani, who is not only a yani, but it is a, a pure yani, it's a saint, you know, it's possible. But uh, it's, you don't find it in every ashram, in every corner in, in India, you know? That's my take. For example, we look at Ramji. Ramji is a great Yani, great Mahatma, but we know that in the personality uh, uh, level, he is the first one to say, I'm not a saint, you know? I bite. <laughs> no? Have you heard him saying that? Lindo. I, I guess it's a good exercise about managing uh, expectations. I'm sorry, Claudia. I over. Uh -huh. Claudia, what do you think? Yeah, no, no, go on, go on. After, I can speak after. Say it again, David. Um, I'm sorry, I've got a lot of uh, outside con construction noise going on. So but, um, I, I'm just, uh, what was I saying then? Um, that you know, it's it's epic, you know, and thinking about my expectations and and what you're talking about moksha, and it's just being able to, um, you, you know, eliminate suffering. I mean, um, I mean, I think Buddha talked about this. I mean, it's like suffering is 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 just a fact of life. Um, you can minimize it, but you can't eliminate it. Correct, you know, ultimately. So really think about expectations and why you're studying and why you're pursuing this and. Uh, and it's get to as close to as close to um, you know permanent moksha, if you will, with an understanding that it's um, it's it's always something that you kind of it's going to come and go. It's going to um, uh, it's ebb and flow uh, to it, and uh, uh, and all we can best to do is um, eliminate the highs and the lows, uh, and kind of create a more sattvic um, environment for ourselves and for our minds. And again, the, the more equanimity we can achieve, the better, you know, the closer we are to being self-actualized. So, yeah. Um, All of I'm that. Gonna, I'm going to turn off my microphone again. Yeah. How about you, Claudio? <laughs> oh, I only want to, to, to share that. Uh, I was uh, exactly on, on this topic this these uh, two weeks. I was doing a strong job of uh, Nididhyasana uh, because I, I you know I try very hard to uh, to apply the logic of Vedanta. And uh, last week, ten days ago, something like that. Uh, I was, I had a um, beautiful experience about that because uh, I was in a moment where I had uh, some worries, you know, I was a little bit emotionally in worry, disturbed, and uh, I tried to apply this logic very strongly also because uh, I see the ignorance that was, you know, fighting that, uh, or also, uh, you know, inside me, I, I was trying uh, to to apply the the like vipassana things, but uh, I change it, you know, I change it, try to apply the logic of Vedanta and um, and the the things, I, I, I was thinking that uh, uh, if I can see the worry, I, I cannot be the worry. I cannot be, I, I'm not touched by the worry. So I was working about this 
that at the beginning I don't understand it, no, because I, I say to me, oh, I, I feel this worry, I feel this uh, uh, pain, no, call it however, however you want. I feel this pain, so I am, uh, I am here and I'm feeling this pain. And in a certain, uh, 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 in a certain point, I see clearly that, uh, um, oh, I, I don't know how to explain it, but I see like the, I, I don't, I see the, that there was only, uh, how I can tell it, <laughs> like the, there was only um, the jiva that was suffering. And then I kind of, recognize that uh, uh, all this sat chitananda you know that there was only this uh, that this, that this consciousness was not touched by the pain uh, but you know that at the same time i uh, i i had i have not uh, the the need to change the pain at a point Sorry for my English. How <laughs> you know? Like I, uh, as always, I, I don't know if I am clear. But uh, um, I was on this topic because the fact that it, it's hard to understand that you are not touched by the pain. That, you talk. That, you talk uh, about about mental, emotional, psychological pain, the disturbance of the mind, right? The mind is what, yeah, disturbance of mind, uh, emotional with so thoughts and emotion. Yeah. So that is an object appearing in you. you mm. but, uh, the problem is when the mind is disturbed. So this discrimination between I consciousness and this phenomenon called mental disturbance, you understand? It cannot really be done by consciousness and consciousness alone. This discrimination, of course, the intellect, the mind. So the consciousness associated to the subtle body, and then we have the, the jiva intellect, and this discrimination needs to take, be taking place there. So this intellect needs more sativa, needs equanimity, needs balance, needs clarity, needs focus. When it is disturbed, this discrimination and you consciousness and, and the mental disturbance it will never happen in consciousness alone. It happens only in the intellect. You understand? Yeah. It becomes frustrating at times because the intellect, when it is disturbed, it cannot really objectify the disturbance as an object that occurs in himself as consciousness. You understand? So this discrimination, again, can only occur in the intellectual intellect of the jiva, the mind of the jiva, the intellect needs to develop focus, clarity, balance, so that it can discriminate. So when I start trying to discriminate a disturbance, which is a mental condition of my intellect, you understand? It's the very, very equipment to do this is under the effect of this mental disturbance, okay? The disturbance happens more on the aspect to emotional. It's more like in the mind and less on the intellect. So the intellect can begin dissociating from the emotional aspect, which is one of the functions of the, of the jiva, subtle body. So it, it can dissociate and then the intellect start watching the thoughts, feelings, emotions, the this emotional discomfort, the psychological discomfort. So it's it's all it's all very subtle, you understand? But ultimately, yeah, very subtle. The intellect are going to be able to to see mental condition, which is more an aspect of the mind. If you look for the 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 chart of Ramji, the triangle, the intellect, mind, and ego, it's something that occurs more into the ego mind level. It keeps observing, observing the stuff, and then the intellect that is under the influence of the mind. You see, every time that happens something, it hits us through the mind. You understand? And the mind, when the mind is agitated, it somehow affects a little bit the intellect. The intellect begins losing its, its discrimination, clarity, and so on, okay? 
So, and then you have somehow get your intellect dissociated from the emotional aspect of your human experience until it, 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 it's less and less influenced by, by this perturbation, by this agitation, by these worries, by these fears, by these desires or whatever, you know? And then gradually the intellect sees the mind objectively and start telling the mind, calm down, calm down, you are not real, I see you objectively, I'm going to present to you all the reasons not to worry, you know, Ishwara is the one who is taking care of everything, moreover, mind, you have to know, I know I am consciousness and I'm passing it on to you, understand and integrate you as well on your emotional level, you understand? So this work has to come from top to bottom, you understand? So the first thing is to dissociate the, like the subtle intellect from, from, from the experience of mental, emotional disturbance, worries, you understand? And then you start seeing that, and then gradually the intellect is going to free itself from the repercussion or, or, or ripples that are coming from the disturbed mind. You understand? And then the intellect takes control and then helps the mind to calm down. And then you say, okay, now my mind is satiric again. So when the mind is very satiric, 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 when the mind is very satiric, I, I mix up because I keep doing these things in Portuguese language and then in, in, when the mind is very satiric, it's very, very easy to remain, you know, to keep your environment clean because any slight, you know, feeling of disturbance, your, your intellect is still clear and satiric and then you say, no, no you discriminate. The problem is when sometimes these, these little ripples of disturbance grow to become really big, you understand? And then it, it does affect our intellectual faculty, you know? The, the intellect gets also affected by the mind, you understand? So in that case, and then the intellect has to take it over, objectify the mind, calm down the mind, and then slowly, slowly to recover more and more such but such but such but so that he can keep his house clean, you understand, under control. It's more or less like that. So the consciousness is not an experiencing entity. The consciousness cannot do the discrimination. You understand, when we say that uh, we have to develop an objective, objective view of the, of the intellect, of the mind, and so on, it's a way to speak because consciousness cannot do that. What does that is the intellect, which is shine with consciousness. The intellect. The, and the more such is this reflection, the more we can objectify all the aspects of our, our jiva, you know, as the emotion, the ego and this and that, and even the notions that, that somehow that makes up this intellect, but the intellect in the end is this very, very poor and subtle witnessing conscious principle, which is the closest thing to pure consciousness, you understand? It's, the, it's shining in the subtle body, it does not shine in the causal body, it shines in the subtle body, and the more subject is this, inter, this intellect, the closer it is to the pure light of consciousness, you know, which, which clarity to understand all this object, this phenomenal object that occurs below, below the line of the intellect, you understand? Mm. It's, in, it's important we, compre we comprehend all of that so that we, we, we can stop ourselves to go into, into mysticism and, and Esotericism and so on, you know, vagueness and abstractions and so on. No, I mean, it's the intellect is, is our, our power, you know, and this, this intellect is extremely subject. It can, it has the, the, the possibility to, to recognize its very nature as pure consciousness. 
<clears throat> we don't want to keep a, a, a disturbed subtle body, a disturbed jiva. A disturbed jiva in, in the end, it's, it's disturbed. Even all through the three bodies, the physical body gets disturbed, goes off balance, the seas starts settling in, the causal body gets affected, and then we can't even sleep in the night properly. Understand? And, and, the, and the subtle body, which really makes up the, the visual, you know, the, the jiva in its awakening state, is compromised in its ability of, of discerning, determining, discriminating, and so on. So we, 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 we don't want disturbance to settle in because it takes over the three bodies and then it becomes very difficult to clean up the house, you know, so to speak. We need to keep our, our house nice, nicely clean and, uh, you know, satvic, like David was saying before, satvic uh, environment, lifestyle, and so on. Thank you. In any case, it was very beautiful to, to see all, all this knowledge. Yeah. Um, uh, working, you know, and uh, yeah. it was like the first time that it was very effective to me. So uh, I see like the all the notions that in this year I have uh, assimilate and in this difficult moment it, it, it comes to me spontaneously like so mm -hmm. it was also beautiful and uh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. So we had the G4 today. David left us. We went from G5 to G4. So are you saying then, Arlinda, that basically we can maintain a sattvic intellect even while our mind becomes rajasic and tamasic? we can still maintain that sattva in our intellect? Well, I mean, the, 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 the jiva is uh, it's a single organ, in, well, a pro, uh, integrate organism, I say, it's one single organism. And the, and the mind, the subtle body, the subtle body of the jiva, which is composed by different functions, mental, emotional function, intellectual functions, so this jiva is, is also, again, uh, an integrated uh, organism, okay? So what it means, what affects, what happens in the ego level or in the mind level or the emotional level is going to impact the intellect as well. But the intellect is subtler than the mind. The mind cannot really, thoughts and the emotions cannot really objectify and witness the intellect, you understand? So the intellect has the power to, to, to objectify the mind and the ego, you know, and, and adjust and make adjustments to the way it, it conducts its life, you understand? So when the mind is rajasic or tamasic, it's uh, unavoidably, the, it's going to affect the intellect in its, in its faculty of determining, discerning and so on, because, you know, the physical is rajasic, the mind is a rajasic, the ego is freaking out, you know? And then the intellect is going to be under that kind of, of, uh, of pressure, you know? But yet the solution has to come from the intellect, you understand? So we, we need to, to cultivate and develop enough sattva so to live a happy life because with a more clear sattva intellect, we, we're going to present best, better response to the stimulus coming from the field. So our response are going to be more appropriate, you understand? Timely appropriate. So we want to have an intellect which is uh, predominantly satvic, okay? And sometimes this intellect, it can observe the rajas and tamas coming from the from the body and from the emotions, from the thoughts that start surfacing and so on. And that's where we, we, we all have, uh, on different degrees, the ability to, to, to 
to take to regulate to control you know the, the body the mind and so on and, and keep a proper satvic environment in, in in the jiva's mind jiva subtle body as a as a overall you understand everything that is impacting everything else but a lot of the time the intellect it does have as you said the the power to observe rajas and tamas on the emotional level on the ego level and make adjustments you understand by by the means of knowledge understanding it's easier for us to understand that we are not our emotions right but it's also it's also not that easy not to be a influenced and affected by our emotions to the degree that our intellect intellectual discernment is is not a fact you know it's more difficult yeah. so we are we are integrate system subtle body you understand but the intellect is our our higher judge you know it's is the the boss the boss is the, the intellect it's almost easier to see um when the mind is tamasic than when the mind is rajasic for example if i'm feeling a little bit down it's easier for the internet uh, for the e in intellect sorry to discern that but if i'm angry the intellect immediately gets disturbed and um, doesn't discriminate in any way whatsoever. So it's almost easier to discriminate tamas than it is rajas. Yeah, I, I, I believe so. Tamas is a denser energy, it's more tangible, it's easier to see it, it's settling and so on. But rajas, this, this, this projecting energy it uh, it's more subtle and uh, and and comes a lot of the time unexpectedly you know with uh, with our emotional reactions here and there violent reactions anger irritation and so on it comes like that <clears throat> so it's uh, the best is to to keep an eye on on, on the environment sometimes to keep an eye on on the, the thread of our thoughts or when we uh, interact with people, the 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 interaction, and uh, we want to see where is this conversation, this dialogue going to end. So it's better we cut it off. We cut it, you know. We avoid to go there. So before we get into too much mental, emotional, and intellectual uh, <clears throat> agitation, you know. So the, the Rajas is going to produce this irritation and anger, you know, because it wants to go and, and, and accomplish or gain something. You know? And it is strong sometimes, this the Rajasic reactions, as opposed to Thomas, that uh, you know, it's sitting there, it's dense, and uh, it's gross. And it, we can easily see it more easily, you know, and then it's easier for us to say, okay, you know, I, I, I need to come out of this block of Thomas. But then what happens usually, Mark, is like, oh, but to, to really change things now, I need Rajas. So at the end, it's easier to just uh, Rajas it tendency or emergency personality then then somehow uh, <clears throat> transform or implement change when the personality the mind the body is too tamasic it can be seen but we we, we are there lacking rajas enough rajas to implement the change can you hear me still But doesn't Rajis know? Uh, uh, 
Tamas, uh, two. So if you've got one, basically, opposite or less. Uh, it, it did cut too much. I, I couldn't understand. Has anybody else understood what Mark said? Try to repeat, Mark. No. Okay. Um, following one is always the other. You know, if their tamas is close to versa. Close what? So they are, they are like uh, twins brothers, Rajas and uh, Close behind, they, they come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, what, what often happens is that uh, Rajas leads to Thomas and Thomas leads to Rajas sooner or later, you understand? So when we are too Thomasic somehow, those Thomas have to get so fed up of itself that it begins standing up and, and moving physically and generating some energy to go and drinking a coffee. Or, you know? So Thomas is uh, it's going to have to become Rajas. And Rajas, when it is it's unbalanced, when it is really unregulated, it exhausts so much the body-mind that uh, the body-mind turns into Thomas, you know? gets exhausted. Yeah. We, yeah. we cannot jump from Thomas to, to Sattva. We need to go from Thomas to, to Rajas and then from Rajas to, to Sattva. So, although Rajas can be at times violent, you know, and, and uh, explosive, those emotions, you know, but it's at least there is enough energy there for the intellect to, to do this conversion, you know, to do the discrimination and understand, you know, understand that, that Rajas and then, uh, and then manage the Rajas and say, no, no, I'm not, not going to do these, say these and act like this again and again. So, I want to convert this energy into sativa. So, and then what do we do? We're going to adjust our behavior, our interactions and, and so on. And I'm not gonna go there anymore. I'm not going to begin a discussion with my wife that again and again brings into too much rajas and so on, you know? We need to, we begin getting wiser and wiser. Sativa. Okay. Okay, so I see you next Monday. And uh, good day, good weekend. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnapurnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamevavashishate Thank you, Lord. Thank you, everybody. Namaste. Thank you. We meet again. Nishwara willing. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thanks, Alinda. Thank you, Mark.